from Microbe TV, this is Beyond the Noise, episode number 62, recorded on April 15th, 2025. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me today is your host, Dr. Paul Offit. Hi, Vincent. This is the video version of Paul's column on Substack called Beyond the Noise, cutting to the chase on important health topics. Today, we will have a closer look at Paul's column, RFK Jr.'s Autism Bombshell. Now, as you write, RFK Jr. claims he will find the cause of autism by September. We've launched a massive uh, a testing and research effort that's going to involve hundreds of scientists from around the world. By September, we will know what has caused the autism epidemic and we'll be, we'll be able to eliminate those exposures. Has this disease been ignored by researchers? No. So, so autism was first defined by Leo Kanner in the late 1930s. Um, and at the time, it was considered to be very rare, kind of similar to childhood schizophrenia. But over time, it's become much better recognized. Um, the definition has broadened. There's uh, to include autism spectrum disorder. There's better diagnostic testing. So now it's far more common, um, arguably as common as one in 32 children. Um, and what that has garnered is an enormous amount of resources. Really, the billions of dollars have been spent trying to understand the cause or causes of this disorder. Starting in 2011, when there were $160 million spent by the government, with increases every year up to about $330 million last year, an additional $2, million or $2 billion is going to be spent through the Autism uh, Cares Act over the next five years. So this is a a heavily studied phenomenon, um, autism. And um, uh, R RFK Jr. makes it sound like he's just discovered all this and will let us know exactly um, what the cause is by September, which is a level of hubris that is kind of hard to watch. Specifically, he says he will find out why the, the numbers of autism diagnoses have, have gone up. Now, when did, so discovered in 1930, you said, when did the cases really start to go up? Do you know? I, I'd say probably in the last 15 years. You, mm -hmm. you really started around 2010, 2011, when you started to see more federal funding. And that's just federal funding. I mean, you have groups like the Autism Science Foundation, which also spends millions of dollars trying to understand this disorder. Um, the Autism Society of America. Um, th there are a number of autism societies that found private foundations that have looked that have also spent money giving grants to try and understand this. So, but nonetheless, RFK Jr. is going to figure this all out by September. I wonder if he's aware of all these other studies that have, that have gone on. I mean, they're I under know. they're I under his know. purview now. It's interesting that autism was discovered at a time when there really were no vaccines. That's right. So in the 1930s, what did you have? You had the smallpox vaccine. You had a rabies vaccine. Um, you didn't have a flu vaccine yet. You were just starting to get diphtheria um, and pertussis vaccines, which were invented around the 20s and started to be used around the 30s. But you're right. Didn't have much. So th these, this money <laughs> that you just mentioned for autism research comes from the U.S. government. I presume it's not going to be touched as so many other programs have been canceled by this administration, right? Uh, if it's a priority for RFK Jr., I guess that that money won't be touched. And there is the, the Autism Cares Act, which gives another $2 billion over the next five years, but no need to do things over the next five years since we're going to know everything we need to know by September. What are some of the potential causes of, of autism? Is there just one? It's... It's a complex interplay, I think, between genetic and environmental factors. So the genetic factors include a number of genes, up to 100 genes, really, that have been uh, identified that are associated with this disorder, uh, most of which are associated with sort of synaptic development, meaning how one brain cell communicates with another, and that are expressed often early in pregnancy. Um, there are environmental factors like during pregnancy, uh, infection with rubella, German measles, or infection with cytomegalovirus. Um, the maternal age and paternal age are all uh, also associated. And so um, it's not going to be one thing. I think when RFK Jr. points to the notion that he's going to find it out, I think he already 
knows what he's going to find. And that's been his bias for the last 20 years that it's vaccines that cause autism. <laughs> I was going to just ask you, how can, how can he say he'll find it in four months if it's taken so long by so many researchers to get clues? But, well, you just said it. It's vaccines, right? I, th I think yeah, what he's going to do, I, th I assume it's going to take him, whatever, four or five months to look behind the curtain at the FDA, look behind the curtain at the CDC and be amazed at the fact that here was all these data, here were all these data that in fact showed that it was vaccines and that these these the government was hiding it all, all along and that the pharmaceutical company was hiding it all along. But now that he's head of, of uh, HHS, he's been able to reveal that. And I think if he does that, it is going to be enormously destructive to not just the perception of vaccines, but for the availability of vaccines, the affordability of vaccines. And he will make vaccines more feared and will only worsen the situation now in this country, which is the experience of a massive measles epidemic. And also pertussis is on the rise. Pertussis deaths in this country are on the rise. Rise, all because of this basically fear of vaccines, unre unfounded fear of vaccines. But <laughs> if data existed implicating vaccines and autism, they would have been published. It's not in the way of American science to hide such a big deal, right? Right. Well, I mean, so in 1998, the notion was brought up by a British researcher named Andrew uh, Wakefield that the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine caused autism. You could argue the nicest thing you could say was he raised the hypothesis. Well, it was a testable hypothesis. There have been 24 studies, 24, looking retrospectively at children who did or didn't get the MMR vaccine, controlling for confounding variables, and they all found the same thing. So there's two ways to interpret those data. One, the reasonable way, which is the reason that all these researchers couldn't find that association was because it wasn't there to be found, or RFK Jr.'s way, which is that there's a vast international conspiracy involving hundreds of researchers, all sort of in the pocket of the pharmaceutical industry or the governments, to hide the truth. But he's going to find the truth. And that's what scares me. There, there, he is appealing to something in this country that's very real, which is this notion that we're not really getting the right information. I mean, I got an email from a nurse, actually, who said she was seeing a one-month-old. The one-month-old was... was um, going to be getting vaccines uh, at two months of age. So she was explaining to the parents what to expect in terms of vaccines. And the father said, and I quote, I'm not anti-vaccine, but I'm going to wait to hear which vaccines Robert F. Kennedy Jr. recommends before I get them. Oh, my gosh. This is great. And a lawyer, you're going to wait till a lawyer tells you what vaccines to get. What have we come to? So how does this September relate to this to the other study that he's going to do to specifically uh, look at uh, vaccines and autism again uh, something by the way that he promised not to do I mean when when uh, Senator Cassidy and Senator Sanders um, interviewed him for that during that second confirmation hearing he was pushed on this and then with the the uh, it was Cassidy who's a Republican from Louisiana said you know to 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 do any more studies in this is to just basically waste money and frankly, it isn't fair to children with autism because there are a lot of promising leads. Why don't we pursue those instead of pursuing this fruitless dead-end hypothesis that's pretty much um, um, been answered? I, I just, uh, it, it, he has, he, RFK Jr., has this fixed, immutable, religious-like belief that vaccines cause autism and nothing is going to convince him otherwise. And he's going to, quote unquote, find that he was right all along and just further make vaccines uh, more difficult to to uh, to get in this country. He's going he's gonna to do everything he can to destroy the vaccine infrastructure in this country. And I don't see why we should expect anything different since this has been who he's been for the last 20 years. The only difference is now he's in a position to make policy. Okay. I don't see what he's going to find unless he makes up data because there, no, there are no data behind the scenes at CDC and FDA that implicate vaccines. I'm quite sure. So do you think he will make it up? Yes, he'll do what he did at the second confirmation hearing when he held up this paper by Mawson and colleagues, which he said was the gold standard paper 
showing that this, this Medicaid evaluation in Florida proved that vaccines cause neurodevelopmental delays, including autism. But look at that paper. First, it was never published in a medical journal. It was never published in a scientific journal. It was critically flawed. It was, it, you couldn't even tell who got vaccines when or whether they'd gotten them through the Medicaid system or through the Vaccine for Children's program. Uh, it was never peer reviewed. It was funded by an anti-vaccine group, the National Vaccine Information Center. It wasn't a study at all. It was so methodologically flawed as to be just um, uninterpretable. And nonetheless, he held that up as a gold standard study. Why? Because he believes this to be true no matter how weak the data. And that is, I think, what you're about to see. The only difference now is it's going to be under the imprimatur of health and human services. All right. So what's the fellow's name that he's enlisted to, to do this study? David Geyer. David Geyer. Yeah. Okay. So he'll put David Geyer to work and they will come up with some scientifically implausible paper, uh, which they purport is the gold standard, another gold standard <laughs> implicating vaccines and autism. Um, if he implies that these data existed already at the FDA and CDC, presumably some people who work there need to open their mouths and, and speak up, no? Or people that who've would, been fired. That would be nice. I mean, so David Garrett worked with his father, Mark, who actually recently passed away, and published papers uh, looking really at thimerosal, this ethyl mercury containing preservative in vaccines, to see whether it was associated with autism. And they were horribly done. These papers were reviewed by the Institute of Medicine and, and said to be methodologically flawed as to be uninterpretable. And uh, that's who David Geyer is. And so, but he's RFK Jr.'s kind of guy because he's basically goes along with the notion that you can shoehorn data uh, into a hypothesis and make it fit. And that's, I, I think that's what we're, we're about to see. I could be wrong. I mean, it may be that, um, that RFK Jr., like, like any reasonable scientist, has an open mind as to what he might find. But I feel what he has is something no scientist should have, which is a non-falsifiable hypothesis. All right. So let's say he, he comes out with some bogus data on associations of vaccines and autism. What do you think he will do with that? I think he will hold it up as an aha moment. Look, look what I found. Look what I found when I looked behind the curtain. We were right all along um, and appealing to this enormous sense of conspiracy that we're being told things that aren't true by people who mean to do us harm. And there is that sense in this country. And I think that will do a lot of harm to children in this country. That, that's who the big losers are here, are the children who are going to be caught up in this um, maelstrom of misinformation that's only going, going to make parents more fearful and may ultimately make vi vaccines less affordable. What worries me in this is that he can fool around with a vaccine injury compensation program to make it so that vaccines are less protected and are more uh, subject to civil litigation. And then we're, we're right back where we were in the early 1980s before there was the National Childhood Vaccine Injury Act when we had 18 companies that made vaccines and by the end of the decade had four. This is a fragile market. I mean, I think people look at the, the COVID vaccines as being truly what they were, which was a windfall for Pfizer and Moderna because it was a guaranteed market. And it was paid by the federal government, but that's not the way it usually works here. And um, vaccines are made by four companies. It's less than 10% of what they do because vaccines are given once or a few times in a lifetime, not every day. So they're never going to compete with drugs like li lipid lowering agents or psychiatric drugs or neurological drugs. And so this, it's a fragile market. I mean, make it more expensive for these companies to, to uh, make these vaccines and they'll stop making them. And then where are we? Do you think he can have MMR delicensed? I think he can do much. I think he could say, I don't think this vaccine has been studied well enough. I mean, the MMR vaccine came out in 1971. I mean, he could say, I don't think it, that you had a, a long enough study. I don't think enough children were studied. Um, I don't think you had the right placebo group, not that you could really have a placebo group, because you couldn't. I mean, you had a measles vaccine by, by 1968. You had a mumps vaccine in 67. You had a rubella vaccine in 69. Those were combined to be a single vaccine in 1971. Was, was the MMR vaccine tested against placebo? Of course it wasn't. It wouldn't have been an ethical thing to do. You knew that those three vaccines worked. So when you combine them, you can't do a placebo-controlled trial, which is what he's always asking for. He could, he could do that. There was a former HHS uh, secretary who said, I can't believe the power I have with the stroke of a pen. So he could <laughs> demand another clinical trial of MMR? 
although he, he couldn't couldn't ever demand the kind of trial he's always asking for, which is a placebo control trial for for vaccines that you already know work. You you can't do that. It's not ethical to do that. You can't give children no vaccine. If you do that, then you right where you were with Samoa when you had 83 children die or where you are now, where you've had three people die, two of whom are healthy young children because their parents chose not to vaccinate them. That's not an ethical thing to do. I'm not sure that it not being ethical would stop RFK Jr. <laughs> Meaning you're saying we should find a way to stop RFK Jr. Is that your point? Uh, yeah, I think so. That was going to be my last question. Is what, what can we do about RFK Jr.? So, so what stops RFK Jr.? I mean, he's, he clearly is a, a virulent anti-vaccine activist. He's a science denialist, and he's a conspiracy theorist. And the part I don't get is it's clear that he's willing to look at 24 studies of MMR being shown not to cause autism and say, I don't believe that. Why do we think he'd be good with other science? I mean, why do we think that he, when he talks endlessly about ultra-processed foods and, and moving us away from ultra-processed foods, well, it would be interesting to know whether eating ultra-processed foods really does make you less healthy or eating food additives really does make you less, meaning these uh, artificial uh, dyes or, or, uh, preserve, or coloring agents. I mean, does that really make you less healthy? I mean, there's ways to study that. Would he believe those studies? Uh, there's no evidence to to think that's true because he has these sort of fixed beliefs. I think what stops him ultimately is measles or whooping cough. I mean, so they're they're roaring back right now. You're, you have a number of states that are seeing pertussis deaths that have never seen pertussis deaths in years. Um, you now have three deaths from uh, measles in, in this country when that equals the total number of measles deaths in the last 25 years. And, and that's not a good look for, for him. It's not a good look for the anti-vaccine movement. And I think they're doing everything they can to sort of distance themselves from this by saying things like, well, it really wasn't measles or, well, it was medical malpractice. Or my personal favorite is when he got up and said, look, there's 127,000 cases of measles in this sort of European root region uh, of the WHO, as well as uh, several dozen deaths. Look at how well we're doing. We only have three deaths. You know, we only have what's probably now about 3,000 cases. We're the envy of the world. I would I would compare it to what's happening in Europe now. We've had 640 cases here. We've had 127,000 cases and 37 deaths. And so what we're doing right here in the United States is a model for the rest of the world. This is what he said. I mean, he said that here's the, here's the European region that's doing worse. Like, we're doing better than, than Romania. We're doing better than Kazakhstan. Why don't you compare us to, like, Germany or France, where we're doing much worse, and they have much more similar healthcare systems and, uh, and, and surveillance and uh, vaccine availability. But he doesn't do that. But as we mentioned last time, I think, or maybe the episode before, he did say the best defense against measles is MMR. So how do we stack that against everything he's saying here? He says it grudgingly. Measles vaccines limit the spread. Mm -hmm. But and you said you said it was the most effective way to limit the spread. Limit the spread. But yeah, but look at him when he says it. I mean, it's painful for him to say. I, look, he looks like he's in a hostage situation when he says it. I feel like he should be holding up a newspaper with today's date on it. I mean, it's it's it, it's obviously not something he believes, and I think it's something the administration is asking him to say because it's true. And when he says it's the uh, it's the best way to prevent measles, it's the only way to prevent measles, and it's also a safe vaccine, which he will never say. We will put the link to this column in the show notes. That's Beyond the Noise with Dr. Paul Offit. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Vincent.